Welcome to the 2023 Groundhog Day presentation of Coal to Coke, a very vital part of the Punxsutawney region for nearly 30 years. Shirley Sharp and Nancy Anthony present, and Tom Curry uh, did the artistry on the Coke oven mock-up. Thanks for joining us. This is a picture of what the Coke ovens looked like in those days when they were running full tilt, nearly round the clock, all year Good long. audio that way? Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome to the Punxsutawney Area Historical Society and our latest uh, exhibit, the Coke Oven Display. This display of, uh, or a mock-up of Coke ovens that used to exist here in the Punxsutawney area. There used to be about 1,700 Coke ovens, uh, some at Walston, Adrian, and Eleonora. Uh, those were owned by the Rochester and Pittsburgh Coal and Iron Company and we also had coke ovens at Horatio and those were owned by the Burrow and White Company. So all in all there were close to 2,000 coke ovens in the area. 2,000? Yes wow. and there were even more eventually placed here uh, in later years Coke ovens were here from about 1883 through 1912 and as late as the early 1920s. Coke is produced uh, and shipped to iron manufacturers uh, for smelting iron and for turning iron into steel. If you look at the Coke oven, what you will see are these doors that are have a brick face on them. Within this uh, coke oven assembly, that's the door to the beehive oven. The beehive oven is a rounded brick format which is in there and is enclosed in a uh, bed of clay and uh, gravel which holds the heat around the oven. Uh, the way a coke oven worked was the, uh, in the company would light every other oven and begin the coke manufacturing process. After those ovens were lit, they would heat the oven that's between them and when the coal was put into the oven from the lorry, which is a coal car here. It would go down in, the heat would come from the sides and ignite the gases in the coal and those gases would slowly burn off and the uh, effluent from the gases would float out into the atmosphere and create uh, those, its own issues. <laughs> but with that many coke ovens you can imagine what Punxsutawney area might have looked like back in the day. In fact, uh, one writer at the time stated that uh, the Walston Coke ovens at night looked very close to what Dante's uh, view of Hades was. So, and we have a brochure telling you about that. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, here we're looking at remnants of the Coke ovens which exist within the Punxsutawney area. Uh, people who walk in the woods around the town can see these little dips in the ground and wonder what they are. Uh, many of them uh, in the Walston area, Adrian area, and Eleanor area may well be remnants of Coke ovens. This is an example of a deteriorating coke oven where the clay and stone wall have been eroded away and you can see the brick interior where the coke was actually baked. And here is a coke oven top and you can see the hole in the top where the coal was put down through in order to bake it into coke. 
When I talk about the size of a, the Coke ovens, you can see how huge they were. The model outside was about one third the size. In, in this picture, the artist has rendered it. And if you look up on top, there is the, uh, in this case, a donkey pulling the wagon or a mule pulling the larry across that is there to fill the ovens. And down below, the men are doing what they call pulling the oven, pulling the baked coke out of the oven. And they will, before they pull it, they dumped water in to cool it so they could work on it. So it was very important to have good water lines wherever there was a coke up in line. Okay. This is the look of the fork they would have used. A huge fork here that was used to help draw the coke from the oven. Okay. Some of the other pictures here include uh, when the Walston coke ovens were under construction and that gives you an idea of the width of the line of coke ovens. There were coke ovens on both the front and the back side of the wall, and that wall was a mile and a quarter long. It is, was famous for being the longest continuous line of coke ovens in the world, and uh, tourists coming to Punxsutawney did not feel like they could go home until they had seen the coke ovens at night. And this is what the Coke ovens at night look like. It's amazing. Okay. Fire. And in this picture, you can see that the, they have completed the Beehive ovens and they're working to fill uh, the surrounding area with clay. And down below is just a picture of the crew that worked on them, constructing them. It looks like they're almost done there. So you can stop by the Punxsutawney Area Historical and Genealogical Society at the Latimer House and view these pictures yourself. Here, mm -hmm. you can see how substantial the height of these were in comparison. So they uh, were very uh, substantial and that added to the mystery that I had if, if they were that big where is that debris? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a small amount of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. So it, it's, like I said, it's been a learning process for all of us and trying to put it together in a way. Uh, Tom Curry did such a fabulous job on recreating the front, especially to uh, give you a true sense of what the ovens look like it, with his painting and, and using the three-dimensional concept. Yeah. The fact that there's a structure underneath that holds it, mm -hmm. well, okay, mm -hmm. I worked on that, but yeah. this is what yeah. makes the difference, is when you can look at it and say, oh, man, that is so realistic looking. That's what they truly were like. Yeah. That's what's especially nice. And that most of the work was done by hand and a modest amount of horsepower. That's correct. That this was a That's mostly... correct, and at those, at those times, it was primarily manual labor uh, yeah. and certainly getting it into and out of the ovens themselves of course loading from the top and then pulling it out from the front that's all manual labor i did see pictures of some of the coke ovens that were um, two of them side by side or they were okay. staggered uh -huh. so offset between the openings that you see, you would have had one on the other side. Okay. So the railroad would go, still go down through the middle, but load from the middle and use a chute to get the coal into oh, its, okay. its individual oven. I saw some pictures of ones that were three deep that you oh. could, again, use the, uh, the auger, pop, the chute mm -hmm. on the lorry to uh, load the coal to whichever oven you were trying to fill. I haven't figured out how they got the coke out Back of the out. one that was in the middle. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense if you have two. I don't know how you do it when you have yeah. one in the middle row, but they must have known it. As time went on, though, they began to capture 
uh, found a use for some of the byproducts, the gases that were released. They were able to capture that and turn it into something that was useful in industry. So as that became more of and more of a process, then the the creation or the style of the Coke ovens needed to change, change. Okay. to enable them to better capture some of those byproducts and eventually turned it into moving to that direction and that style of oven and the style that we had here uh, went by the wayside. Okay. All right. So in what we have known in our growing years, of course, was the remnants that we have seen uh, along the walkways. We still have some here now. Yeah and enjoy uh, okay. seeing them. But again, even as I have gone along the walk areas and seen the remnants we have, they didn't give me any evidence of the structure no. that was on no, the outside I mean, of them. This is what I've seen, and you don't get the, any of the outside structure at all to it. Um, now you can get a little bit of sense around here. This could have been some of the fill that was between this oven and this oven yeah. to help fill in. And of yeah. course the box of the structure would have contained that and held it together. And yeah. over the years, whatever that debris was, they hauled it out and, and it has uh, allowed trees and so forth to grow up through it. Yeah. So that's being the this top is, entrance. This is the top entrance of one of those Coke ovens. Yeah. Very neat. All right. At the front end of the Iron Man would be an auger that uh, would be air driven into the uh, mines to be able to loosen the coal and it could be uh, removed that way. Instead of bending over and breaking your back, this would allow uh, the coal to be loosened and pulled out. It would be uh, a machine-driven version of the breast auger that I had just showed you a moment ago. Also next to that are knee pads that the miners would wear when they were working in low coal. Uh, they would be basically kind of crawling along on their knees, and this would help prevent their knees and clothing uh, from wear and tear. Uh, next we have a lunch bucket. They used to keep the uh, food itself in the upper section and in the lower area, in the, the big area in the bucket you'd use for water or coffee to have that through the day. Uh, blasting caps were very, very sensitive and uh, easily uh, exploded. So they were kept in these uh, cardboard, or cardboard, in this wooden box to keep them safe and protected until they were used. And next is a power uh, powder flask that carry the explosives that would be used with the uh, explosive cartridges. On the upper section we have different lamps and uh, lighting devices that were used. They're cardboard lamps and oil lamps and so forth. As we go to the top of the case, this is a picture of uh, the Coke ovens at Walston. I think you were just outside looking at a model version of the Coke ovens. This is an actual photograph of the ovens. You can see the Coke ovens along the row in the back with the lorries going across the top and, and emptying coal into the holes in the top of the ovens. And then the uh, coal and so forth as it was pulled out of the ovens after it was the coke after it was prepared was uh, emptied into the uh, big containers in the front and then pulled along on the railroad lines and moved out of there we have a number of pictures this happens to be a picture uh, or a um, drawing of what the mines had looked like in the area you can see the longest string of coke ovens uh, going here this is in the area of the uh, cemetery up by, by the Columbus mining area by the uh, country club. Okay. And this is the area of the country club itself. And over here is Walston. Wow. And again, as you're going along, this is Sawmill Run. This is the 
the creek that went through that area. And as we down in this area was more into uh, Lindsay, at that time would have been Lindsay, later became a part of Punxsutawney. This uh, wooden structure is a model of a tipple that had been created in honor of the 100th anniversary of the United Mine Workers in memory of Robert Johnston, who was a resident of South Mahoning Township in Indiana County. He had passed away in a mine accident at the Sag Sagamore Mines. Mr. Johnston happened to be the grandfather of Roger Steele. But as you can see, uh, in this structure, the coal was uh, coming across the top on the rail lines, and it was loaded then into, the, in this case, uh, trucks that went underneath uh, to receive the, the loads of coal. It could have been that uh, underneath would have been a rail line, and it would have been loaded directly onto coal cars for uh, being sent by the railroad to different parts of the uh, state and up into New York. You'll see up on the wall behind us several miners who uh, in the, you see their, carb their carbide lights on their helmets. Uh, you can imagine on those hats that was their version of a safety helmet. Uh, so I I'm sure you would realize that they didn't really do a whole lot of protecting no. in those days in comparison to the danger that they faced every day. But they are uh, taking a, a little break from their hard, hard, hard work uh, in the mines and they are actually sitting on a tool and in the lower part of the photo you will see uh, coal that they are sitting on. So it has been a wonderful opportunity to showcase some of the impact of coal and coke in the Punxsutawney area uh, as we are looking at the demonstrations just now. So we thank you for joining us. Okay. During the next 10 years, people of the of Punxsutawney accepted a new normal, which included strikes, uh, mine closings, and reopenings. In the Punxsutawney News of 1904, or 1894, said, the smoke and odor of sulfur from the Walston and Adrian Coke Works Coke oven is not very pleasant when one gets to the leeward of it. But the ovens have been idle so long that we can stand almost anything for a change. So let the smoke roll upward and sulfur fill the air. <laughs> it indicates that work is going on and money is being put in circulation, and that helps relieve our distress. Oh my. Okay, the people of Punxsutawney were changing. The Fairview correspondent to the Punxsutawney News of February 24th, 1909, uh, stated that she had there was plenty of room for more houses. People who are seeking a nice, quiet suburb of town where there's no Coke oven line should come to Fairview and invest in her charms. <laughs> so if she was far enough, she didn't think the dirt would get to her. Oh my. He was, he, the part over here, I think I skipped this line, that no Coke oven smoke to soil the wash is the tanks. Uh, can you imagine, you just washed everything and then it's all yuck again. Yeah. Oh. They used to talk in Pittsburgh that the guys would change their collars partway through the day because of that. And this is when we had somebody in here who said he worked in coking, but the, the things he worked in didn't look like this. And I imagine they looked more like this. It was a um, called a hopper. And this oven held 13 tons of coal in an airtight chamber that was heated from the outside by the company's smelting furnaces. Oh, the gas okay. and other byproducts were carried off into a retort where they were separated, saved, and processed for sale. 
and that article went on to ta say what it was that they those different products were. So this became a cleaner industry because they reused what was because coming they, off. They, oh, okay. and and sulfuric all the sulfuric acids and other things which were still chemically worthwhile. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, but when the United States Steel Plant at Gary, Indiana opened these huge ones, now that happened earlier. See, this is 1910. This is called the rise That's and probably fall. why this version deteriorated. Well, and local pundits uh, talked about the the benefits and the cost of installing those and. Uh, by that time, the coal industry was moving down into Ernest, Lucerne Mines, Kawashanik Valley, down that way. Oh. And new technology changed declining resources and the cost of converting ovens combined to do that. Kind of okay. put these guys into the lesser... Right. And so how I end the article is... What remains of the once mighty Coke ovens are remnants scattered in the woodlands, the names of communities in Punxsutawney, name, and a street in Punxsutawney named Coke Oven Lane. Coke Oven Lane, okay. Which is where Bob Lott and Bob Stefanik live on Coke Oven Lane. <laughs> Thank you for joining the Punxsutawney Historical Society as we present our new display about the Coke ovens and how Coke is produced. A special thanks to Shirley Sharp and Nancy Anthony for narrating for us, and also to Tom Curry for his great artistic work. Thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe.